Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On January 28, 1958, a patent was filed under the title Toy Building Brick by Lego Company, which according to Forbes is now worth $8.6 billion, that's with a B, dollars. Curious, because much like the Lego Company, the NFL had a linchpin moment in 1958 leading to future growth beyond anyone's wildest dreams. This week's guest expands on this game and what it resulted in the NFL's growth for the 1960s. The game, you ask? Well, it's simply referred to as the greatest game ever played. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you Come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is December 28th, 1958, and we're in Yankee Stadium. The reason why we're here is to witness a monumental moment in NFL history. It happens to be the championship game between the New York Giants and the Baltimore Colts. But we're not going to get into the details at this moment. However, this game resulted in a course of events leading to the NFL becoming by far the most popular and profitable sports league in America. And this week's guest lays out why he thinks that the 1960s, which he kind of includes that game in the 1960s almost, not for just football, but 1960s in America played a huge role in how things are today. And this week's guest is Patrick Gallivan, author of Pro Football in the 1960s, the NFL, the AFL, and the Sports Coming of Age. And we're going to go ahead and get into many unique topics and stories from this book. But first, Patrick is offered to send a free autographed copy of his book to one lucky winner. And to enter in this contest, you need to head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. And while you're over there on the site, you can easily navigate over to this week's episode to learn even more beyond what we cover in the podcast. Also, while you're at it, this is a little reminder for you to subscribe for free to the show by bashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, fresh, south of the press episodes we'll each and every week. And that's going to be important because next week is when we're going to announce the winner for Patrick's book. But for now, let's get into some 1960s football with Patrick Gallivan. As I'm sitting here, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm holding your book. I have Pro Football in the 1960s, the NFL, the AFL, and the Sports Coming of Age by Patrick Gallivan. And I know you sent me that that note. We had to reach back to the end there, kind of like the last chapter. Really, I mean, there was another chapter after that, I suppose, the closing, but it, the dream. And it's something that I think that kind of a story that subtly summed up the decade in a few pages. And let's go ahead and start there and work our way backwards. What was that the dream all about? The the dream was an article. It came, comes from an article I found in Esquire magazine uh, written by David Moranis. He's the person, you might recognize the name, he's the person that wrote a very excellent, excellent book. I highly recommend it on um, Vince Lombardi, When Pride Still Mattered, I believe is the title. And uh, this article, um, I think it was a cover story, and there were various articles on uh, football in this uh, magazine that that month. And uh, his was titled, When Football Mattered. And um, 
basically, it's it's a it's a story that would be hard now to go back and try to talk to people to see whether it really happened or not. So some people might be questioning it. But this was the time when Vince Lombardi was in the hospital. They had discovered cancer, and he was in the hospital. Various players would come uh, visit him in the hospital, and it was his later days. His wife, Marie, spent most of her days there in a chair at the side of his bed. Um, And at times, he would drift off and fall asleep. And she was there one time listening um, to his restless sleep. And he blurted out, Joe Namath, you're not bigger than football. Remember that. And, (laughs) And you could tell. You know, Vince Lombardi, as you as you read a lot of the bios about him, he was a very religious man. At one point, he considered um, going into the priesthood when he was younger. Um, he always thought he was more than a football coach. He thought that he was helping men become better men. At the same time, he was helping them become um, better football players. And for him, he went to daily mass. He was raised Catholic, and he still went to daily Mass every day. That's how he started his day. He found the religion provided him with order against the chaos of the outside world, and he just thought that it helped him immensely to be able to uh, reach back and have that inner strength. I think as the 60s went on, here's my interpretation of the dream, as the 60s went on, there were things that were happening throughout the decade that really bothered him. He saw the riots in the street. He saw youth rebelling against, uh, maybe against their parents or against authority. And he didn't like some of those things that were happening. And in his subconscious, it the subconscious maybe took over and formed his dreams. And uh, they were represented in, in the fact of Joe Namath because he loved football probably so much. And Joe Namath probably represented some of that youth. He had the modern hair cut and the mod clothes and and was probably the celebrity football player at the end of the decade. And so maybe that's why he honed in on um, on Joe Namath in particular. And, uh, you know, of course, Lombardi always thought football was a team game and a team sport and no one person should be b- bigger than the other. And uh, maybe in his mind, he was thinking Joe Namath was getting just a little bit too much attention uh, by the media and by football fans in general. And maybe that's what was happening when he um, reacted the way he did in his, his, in his in that dream sequence. I thought it was a great story, though, because when I look at the book and I look at the 60s, I thought they were dominated by Lombardi in the beginning of the decade, Lombardi and other uh, tough coaches who was my way or the highway type approach. And towards the end of the decade, we saw the greater influence of players, players, uh, you know, with it turning into show business, uh, and in particular, uh, Namath represented in that way. So it to me, it summed up a lot of what I was talking about throughout the book, about the changes that were happening, some of the changes that were happening in the country during the 60s. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it happens, of course. Every generation that takes over from the previous generation, there's always some kind of uh, whatever you want to call strife of power or the mentality approach. And I got to imagine that if Vince Lombardi were to be here today with the way that you said it's been turned into almost like a big hoopla show and fantasy football and contracts and individual records and things like that. I wonder what you would think of how it, how it came to where it is. It'd be interesting to contemplate and see whether he would um, sometimes really, really good coaches like him can adapt. And it would be interesting to see, because I don't think a lot of the things that happened in the 60s and a lot of the things that you point out, like fantasy football and the really super media focus. uh, Look, Lombardi didn't have to worry about 24-hour sports channels on television and radio like we have today. And, and, you know, the just explosion of media upon the league. Um, So some of that probably would not fit well with him. But Lombardi was a man that really was socially conscious 
and could adapt to a lot of things. Um, one of the surprises I found in my research was the fact that Lombardi um, was really dead set against, now this sounds like, you know, being against Christmas or something, but he was dead set against discrimination in any form. He thought that he had been discriminated against. He had gotten passed over for college jobs before he got the head coaching job in Green Bay. He was a, trying to become a head coach at either college or professional level. And uh, he, at that time, he was an assistant with the Giants, the New York Giants. And he was trying to get a advance himself in his career. And he felt like he was being discriminated against because he was Italian American and his complexion was a darker skin complexion. And after being out in training camp, out in the sun all summer, he probably got a little darker than than he originally was, you know, just by being out in the sun. Uh, there's there's stories that numerous people tell about him being discriminated against when he was trying to take his wife to dinner where they wouldn't allow them as a couple to enter the restaurant because they thought here this dark-skinned man was trying to take this blonde woman into the restaurant and wouldn't allow him in. Uh, his team uh, was discriminated against in the South because, again, and these were the days of Jim Crow in the, uh, in the southern part of the United States, and there were times where they would not let his team stay all together, the entire team, blacks and whites, in the same hotel. Uh, he even got to the point where he would take them to a military base because then they could all stay together in, in one building um, to, to, to avoid any kind of discrimination um, of, that, of that nature. So he was very tolerant of, of the, that type stuff. So it, it's interesting to say, and we don't know the right answer. We don't know how he would react today. You know, that's <laughs> right, all just yeah. speculation. But there's one side of me that says he was a very tolerant man. Maybe he'd understand, but I don't know how well he'd handle all the media that we have today. That um, that would be totally, <laughs> totally uncommon for him coming from the era that he came in. That's one of those kind of unique things that I like to contemplate, not specifically this this event, but just when people go what they call out of time, whether they come forward or go backwards. And that's one reason why I started the show too, because I'm a major, uh, if you ask me what one of my favorite genres is for movies or something, it's, it's tr time travel because it's just such an intriguing factor. And one decade that I constantly, I guess you could say, I don't want to say learn about, but it's like a decade that sticks out. Of course, you have the forties with world war two, you have world war one back in the teens and the roaring twenties, but the sixties, it seems like that's where like, there was definitely a, I don't know, a linchpin, if you want a, a transition for the country. And could you give me maybe a little bit of a landscape of why you, what was going on in the sixties and then why you wrote a book? Why did you choose the sixties for a football book? Whoa, let me jump in and cut myself off here for a real quick minute before we get into why Patrick wrote a book about the 1960s. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this week's sponsor. The Professional Football Researchers Association is a nonprofit educational organization that's dedicated to preserving and promoting the history of professional football. It was formed in 1979. The organization has regularly published its magazine, The Coffin Corner, as well as a host of books. Their website has articles, game books, line scores, and a multitude of other archival materials for researchers as well as fans of the game. This is available all for the members. Every two years, the PFRA holds their convention with guest speakers and special events. To find out more information about the PFRA or to join the organization, go to their website, profootballresearchers.com. Or you can follow them on Twitter, at Football History, or follow them on Instagram, at PFRA underscore photos. And speaking of the PFRA, Patrick has written articles himself for the organization that have shown up in the coffin corner. It's kind of one of the perks, like I said, of being a member. Everything I've seen from this organization is they work to get people like yourself that are passionate about preserving the history of the game, as well as maybe uncovering topics that have not been shared in many decades over and put them out so other people can learn about it. Again, you can head to profootballresearchers.com or even find the links on the Sports History Network website. 
Now let's get back in and figure out why Patrick wrote a book about pro football in the 1960s. Well, when I think, I'm like you, I love history. And when I think back to the decades that I, in my own opinion, that I think are really particularly interesting, I think of two decades. And I think of the 1860s, which had Abraham Lincoln, the war between the states, um, lots of big events in the 1860s, very interesting time. But then closer to when I'm around is the 1960s. So many things happened. And if you start to think about it, just think back to your American history classes, maybe even more than the 1860s. Um, you had three major political figures assassinated during the 60s. John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King. There were many others too, but those are the biggest names that we hear about. Then you had um, you had the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was raging over in Southeast Asia. Young people were sent over there on a war they didn't quite understand or maybe didn't agree with, which then had some protests in the streets. There were civil rights protests that were going on at the same time. Uh, even though all while all that's happening, we had uh, the space race and the Cold War against the Russians. So not to mention pop culture. I mean, we had the Beatles came over in the 60s and the English invasion of music and Woodstock in the later part of the 60s. So, so many things on the just the, the broader level. And then I started to think, what does all that have to do with football? And I thought, there's a lot of stuff happening on the football uh, world in football history during the 60s. You know, in 1959, there were only 12 teams, 12 teams in the National Football League. That's all, just 12. And they were pretty much located, uh, central, or not centralized, but regionalized in mostly the Northeast. There were some exceptions, but the furthest south, the southern team you had was Washington, D.C. Um, you had a team or two in California, but then they were all around the Great Lakes. You had Detroit and Chicago. Uh, Philadelphia, New York, uh, all centrally located in the northeastern part of the country. Uh, so there were other cities in the United States starving for football that have it today, but didn't have it then. Um, and then, of course, we all know that culture and sports blend and are intertwined. Um, so if you have discrimination in the society in general, you, you probably see some discrimination in sports. Um, lots of big events happened in, in the sports in general during the 60s with the, the salute, the power, black power salute in the 1968 Olympics where two of American sprinters uh, protested during the national anthem, um, causing a lot of attention by other athletes and other sports. Um, but just looking at the game, because I know a lot of people will say, can you get to football? And just when you think about football, look how much different the game was in football. You had ground game oriented football attacks. You had huge, some of the best runners in football were fullbacks. If you can think, we barely have fullbacks in today's game, but you had Jim Brown, Jim Taylor. At the end of the 60s, you had Larry Zonka. The American Football League had some powerful runners, foot, fullbacks like uh, Jim Nance and Hewitt Dixon. Um, there were some really strong running backs because it was a game that was really more focused, especially in the National Football League, on the ground game. Later on, you had some more uh, wide open play that, as the American Football League was introduced and was trying to gain fans. They threw the ball a little bit more. Um, the, I started to say the 1959, you had 12 teams. By the end of the decade of the 60s, you were up to, I think, 26. Um, lots of other changes that impact football. You had NFL Films. NFL Films was created in the early part of the 60s. They did the 1962 AF, or NFL championship game, kind of started them in that world. And, and we've all grown up watching NFL film broadcasts. It's amazing to see the job they do, glamorizing the game and, and recording the history of the game like they do or like they have done. 
But the other thing that comes hand in hand with that is the changes that we saw in broadcasting happened. A lot of them happened in the 60s. Instant replay was introduced in the 1960s. Um, There's other things that, as I was writing my book, I had to toss out of the book because it was getting too big. But you had a stadium explosion where people... They wanted bigger stadiums. They wanted football-only stadiums, and they introduced a lot of stadiums uh, being built. A lot of them looked a lot the same, like Shea Stadium or Riverfront Stadium in in Cincinnati. Those were all built in the later part of the 60s as well. So lots going on. I just thought, if anything, if any decade, if you could pick out any decade which makes a lot of impact in the game, I thought it was the 60s. Um, I know other authors have looked at different decades, like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. To me, it's the 60s. So much changed during the 1960s. And, and that's some of some of these stories and some of these things I tried to put in the book. Yeah, in my lifetime, I mean, I would say that there has been change. So, of course, I was around when free agency was a, finally enacted, but I was too young to really re- know what was going on. Um, I guess you could point to fantasy football, but that was there before I guess maybe the dawn of the internet and like you said, 24 seven exposure to everybody knows everybody's or every player on every team now versus before it was just, they rooted for their own team and that type of thing, but not like major, I don't know, institutionally changes like we've seen in different decades. And even before the sixties, there was a really important game that happened. And I know we talk about that a little bit, but what do you think that, the NFL 1958 championship and Lamar Hunt, how does that story kind of interweave into leading into the 60s? Well, the, the, the 1958 game was really critical for it. It started this whole explosion. I kind of cheat a little bit and call 1958 as part of the 60s because the explosion of the game happened as a result of that game. If everybody, some might not be familiar with that game, that's the game that Baltimore and New York Giants played. It went into overtime, and you saw John Unitas lead the Colts on two, uh, like two minute drives. We're used to calling in in the football world two minute drives where he led the team down the field first to tie up the score in regulation, and then next to win the game in overtime. And so that was a critical game because um, a lot of people joined. Uh, or st- were introduced to the game, uh, to the game of football by watching that one football game. It was very exciting at the end. The beginning of the game was a little mistake filled, a lot of errors. And so they call it the greatest game ever. Uh, some people debate that. That's another topic for uh, sports talk radio, I guess. If they had sports talk radio in those days, maybe they would debate that <laughs> and say, well, it was or it wasn't. I mean, a lot of the Giants fans, um, like Frank Gifford, who fumbled in the game, he uh, he says it was way far from the best, greatest game ever. Of course, he he was on the losing team. So, um, But what happened as a result of that game, that game went into overtime, and um, you had a guy named Lamar Hunt, who uh, was a huge, huge sports fan. He loved all sports. Um, as a kid growing up, he just paid attention to them all. And at that point in his life, he knew he wanted a sports franchise. He wasn't sure at first whether it was going to be baseball or football. And he was exploring uh, the possibility of perhaps um, the Continental Baseball League. And he did a lot of research in the Continental Baseball League, learned a lot about the structure of sports and the business side of sports with uh, different ideas and approaches that people were talking about, about what to do with television broadcasting uh, income and rights and how do you organize the league and how many games you should play and all the finer points that we take for granted today. He, He learned an awful lot in his studies about the Continental Baseball League, and um, he was Debating back and forth which one. Now, he, I think deep down, by my reading, he liked football better. I think the 1958 game cinched it for him. He saw how it ended. He saw how exciting the game was, and he wanted a National Football League franchise. He uh, went to Burt Bell, who was the commissioner at that time, 
of the National Football League and was trying to say, can I get an expansion team? What do I do to try to get an expansion team? Well, Burt Bell throughout the 50s was telling everybody no. He knew his owners were not willing to um, expand the league at that point. There were a few of them that were dead set against any kind of expansion. And he said, if you wanted to get a team, the best thing to do is go talk to the ownership group uh, that owned the Chicago Cardinals. He thought, if any of my teams are for sale, it could be that one. Uh, Walter Wolfner was um, the person he went to see, and he made repeated visits to Walter Wolfner to try to see, could I buy an interest in the team? Um, could I buy the team outright? He was trying to explore any possible things. He really wanted to buy the team outright and move it to Dallas. That's what his desire was. He was he grew up in Dallas and he wanted a team in Dallas. He was constantly told no by both accounts. The Cardinals ownership group said, no, we're not selling. And um, the National Football League, Burt Bell, said, we're not expanding. So at one point, he said, he was on, the fl on a plane ride flying back from Miami back to Dallas, and he said the light bulb went off because of something that uh, the, uh, Walter Wolfner said to him, because he said, I tell you no, and I tell these other guys no, like that guy in Bud Adams in Houston, and there's an ownership group in Denver that wants in, and then there's another group in Minnesota. All you guys keep coming to talk to me, asking me to sell my team. I'm not selling it to any of you. And the light bulb went off for Lamar Hunt. He said, wow, if there's that many people interested in purchasing the Chicago Cardinals, maybe they just might be interested in a team in a brand new league. And that's when he started to set out to, to create the American Football League and to convince all these owners to um, join ship with him and create a brand new league. He didn't think of it at first to compete with the National Football League, and maybe that's what some people thought, is that he wanted to compete with them out of maybe because he was upset with them that they wouldn't give him a franchise. He envisioned it to be set up more like Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball had an American League and a National League, and they had they shared a commissioner. He thought, why couldn't we do that? There's already a National League. I want to create the American League side. We can ask Burt Bell to be the commissioner of both leagues, so to speak. And uh, that's, I think, what his initial desire was. Um, of course, Burt Bell died. Um, in 1959, and, and some of those plans might have gotten spoiled because um, up to that point, Lamar Hunt was talking to uh, Burt Bell as his main link to trying to get a new team or a team in the National Football League. Yeah, I'd just be kind of curious to see if some different key figures, one way or the other, the decision, or like you said, Burt Bell passes away and then we have a rise and we have a changing of guard, if you will. It was kind of like that in the country, too. I mean, can you talk to maybe, again, the tying in America culture to pro football and some of the changing of the guards? Yeah, and some of it might be just me, but I was thinking when I started to compare American history and football history, I said, wow, 1960 happened. Uh, Burt Bell passed away sudden, uh, unexpectedly. He had a heart attack. When he was watching his two teams, he was associated with both the Eagles and the Steelers during his time. Of course, he was commissioner over all of the leagues, but he was a part owner before he was commissioner of those two teams, the Steelers and the Eagles. And he was there in the stands. He didn't like to sit in a, a luxury box. He liked to sit right there in the stands with the other fans and watch the game. And he was there watching the game when he had a heart attack and Unfortunately, he passed away. Um, they needed a new commissioner for the National Football League, so they set out to find a re replacement or a, another commissioner. About the same time, America was looking for a new president. And if you look at it, the way I look at it, the 50s, you had an older generation in the White House and two younger men were competing with each other. You had Richard Nixon and uh, John Kennedy running for election in 1960. So regardless of which one won, there would be a younger man and a kind of a passing of the torch in the country with a younger president. 
And after uh, like 23 ballots, the owners of the National Football League, and it, they were they were negotiating and talking about who the new commissioner was for a week, if you can imagine. Um, this meeting just went droned on forever and ever, and they threw a, a bunch of names out as to who might be the replacement. And finally, they proposed a name, uh, Pete Rosell. And Pete Rosell had been an executive with the Rams. Um, he was a younger man. I believe he was 33 at the time. Um, but there were times at the Rams where the ownership, the owners were kind of not really harmonious in charge of the Los Angeles Rams. So maybe some people said he might, he did a really good job working with the owners over there and in, in, in Los Angeles during some of those rough times. Maybe he can handle this job. While other people were looked at, looking at him kind of skeptically, maybe, and saying, he's only 33, we'll put him in charge because we can push him around because he's a young man that maybe we can mold or tell what to do. Well, as it turns out, Pete Rosell got the job, and it was generally recognized as one of the most successful commissioners in any pro sports, any, any sport, any league, uh, in maybe the history of sports in this country. So he he was a very successful, generally recognized by everybody as being a very successful person in that role. He, um, so that's one of the connections I had between sports, um, because in sports and, and American culture was the kind of the turning of a leaf with both young people taking over. Um, you could also compare uh, war. Now, the Vietnam War was raging. I know it's life and death, so it's a whole different thing. But there was a business war that was raging between the American Football League and the National Football League, because especially in cities where they directly competed, like in New York, where you had the Giants and the Jets, or in Dallas, where you had the Texans and the Cowboys, or even in uh, California, Northern California, where you had San Francisco and Oakland competing almost for the same um, fan base. And um, those were probably the more heated battles. Again, they weren't life and death like the Vietnam War was, but it was a battle that was raging at the same time that the war in Vietnam was raging. And as the decade went on, there was talk of merger talks. There were peace talks um, going on with the Vietnam War at the same time. So you had a lot of similarities like that where different things uh, were going on in the American history or history in general or society um, that kind of, in, in a way, looked uh, surprisingly similar to what was happening in the pro football world. Yeah, and I guess in in the real world too, you had like the different kind of spying going on. And w was the Kremlin at the height during that time, or was that earlier? And that was the, some of the uh, top points of the of the Cold War was the '60s. We had some of those communist hearings was more the '50s, but you had uh, the U two spying and shoot down of the spies in um, was in the '60s. Um, you also had the Cuban Missile Crisis happened in the 60s and the Bay of Pigs Crisis um, down in Cuba that happened in the 60s. So um, the, the one that I mentioned uh, was a missile crisis, was a huge event with uh, John Kennedy, was challenged way early in his administration when the Soviet Union was trying to put missiles in Cuba that could be fired from Cuba and hit Washington and New York. Um, so sure, the, the Cold War and spying and all those espionage, those type things were uh, really big events in the 60s. I mean, yeah, kind of tying it into football, they did, I mean, of course, again, it's not life and death situations, but life and death for the league in a war, uh, they were really spying different kind of tactics. I'll use that. I'll use air quote, different kind of tactics to try to get players to play for the AFL or NFL. And I mean, what were some of those kinds of events that uh, the battle between the AFL owners and the NFL owners? Yeah, you had the NFL came up with this really ingenious plan. They called them hand holders or babysitters. Um, what they did is they tried to the top prospects, they would try to take out of 
commission. Now that sounds like in a bad way. They, if you were a, a big prospect, they would try to hide you out in a hotel so the American Football League couldn't find you. And at the same time, they were you were hiding out with air quotes there. They would try to convince you of all the it, virtues of the National Football League. You know what? Why do you want to start with these new people that just they've barely been playing football for a few years or a year or two? We've been around for decades in the National Football League, so you need to play for the National. It's the best. And so they would work on their sales approach. Most of these people that were quote unquote babysitters were more marketing people and salespeople by nature. So they were good talkers and they could keep people um, entertained and away from the American Football League um, representatives. There's one big event that they talk about all the time. There's a man called Lloyd Wells, who was hired by the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, and he was a uh, real, he was a, he was a black man. And he was, had worked in the media at some time at, in his past, but he was a scout for the Chiefs. And he predominantly went to a lot of the historically black colleges and universities, that was his um, his best territory because he would look for those type individuals that maybe were overlooked by most of the other teams in the American Football League and maybe other teams in the National Football League. And he knew Otis Taylor uh, for a long time, had been visiting Otis Taylor, who was a prospect in Texas, a uh, college player. Well, the Dallas representatives got him in a hotel room in the vicinity of Dallas and was hiding him out. So um, Lloyd Wells had to go and look and search and search. He made lots of calls to try to figure out where they had him because he figured Otis Taylor was one of my prospects. I expect to sign him. I've known him now for years. And finally, he found out where he was. He was at a Holiday Inn, I believe, in Arlington, Texas, one of the right up around uh, Dallas. He found out where he was. Uh, Lloyd Wells grabbed his camera and he ran to, into the hotel room and he said, I'm with Jet Magazine. I just need to take some pictures of Otis Taylor for, my, for an upcoming magazine article. Now, how about those spy tactics? You think it worked? Did he really get in and get his player? Well, <laughs> you're going to have to find out. You're going to have to tune in next week to figure out if the NFL won or the AFL was the victors as far as that player goes. And don't forget to head over to the website and enter the drawing for your autographed copy of Patrick's book, Pro Football in the 1960s, the NFL, the AFL, and the sports coming of age. You can do so by heading to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. But before I let you go, don't forget to share this show with your friends and family. That way we can continue to share the history of the league that celebrates in less than a month its 100th birthday. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.